The Mediterranean Basin is one of the planet's most biologically rich and complex regions. The crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa is considered to be one of Earth's biodiversity hotspots. A vast number of both animal and plant species unique to the region live in its various habitats. The Mediterranean Basin is located in one of the planet's temperate zones. The subtropical climate makes it cold and wet here in winter, hot and dry in summer, and mild and rainy in autumn and spring. Occupied by human beings for more than 8,000 years, the Mediterranean Basin has experienced dramatic changes to its forest and woodland areas. But nevertheless, they are still among the most diverse on the planet. From marshlands to high mountain ranges, from forests of holm and cork oaks to oak and pine forests high up in the mountains. All of them are home to thousands of animal and plant species whose paths cross on their adventures through life. And each one of them has a story to tell. Stories of the Mediterranean Forest. The Forest of Centenarian Oak Trees. The ancient oak trees, shaped like candelabra, have witnessed mankind's impact on the forest for centuries. In Spain, during the 15th century, the first laws were enacted that forbade cutting Pyrenean oaks on communal land at the trunk. The law warned citizens that they could only use the branches, leaving both horizontal and vertical branches so that the trees could grow, develop and thrive, and thus the woods would be maintained. These ancient oaks, some more than 400 years old, provided curved timber for shipbuilding, charcoal for foundries, and firewood to keep warm in the cold months of winter. For hundreds of years, the hillsides of pruned oak trees served as pasture land for livestock, mainly cattle, the mainstay and driving engine of the rural economy. But all this changed in the late 20th century. The new generations deserted the small towns for urban settings, and the rural economy was slowly but surely eclipsed by the industrial economy. And this shift caused many of these ancient open oak groves, or dehesas, to go into decline. In Salguero de Juarros, a small village in Burgos province, located on a foothill of the Sierra de la Demanda called the Cuesta Lechal, or Suckling Slope, thousands of long live trees have fortunately survived to our days. And in 2015, in this venerable forest of centuries-old oaks, the non-profit Living Paleolithic introduced European bison and Przewalski's horses as part of an international project for the reproduction of threatened species. In the late Pleistocene epoch, very similar bison and horses lived in the northern part of the Mediterranean basin until our ancestors hunted them to extinction. Such was the case of the steppe bison, whose most recent known fossils date from 15,000 years ago.
Although they belong to the same genera, the bison and horses introduced in Salguero de Juarros are different species from those that grazed on these lands thousands of years ago. Nonetheless, contemplating them today certainly takes us back to a past in which nomadic bands of human hunter-gatherers trailed the large herds of herbivores. In their size, body shape, appearance, large head, and bristling mane, the horses of the Pleistocene were very similar to the Przewalski's horse, which was also once quite common in much of Europe. This small horse was discovered in 1879 by Nikolai Przewalski, a Russian general of Polish origin. In 1900, a major expedition was launched to capture live Przewalski's horses and transport them to various zoos around Europe. In the early 20th century, Przewalski's horses still lived in several regions of eastern Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and northwestern China. But in the following decades, the population plummeted as they were hunted to extinction in the wild. The last wild Przewalski's horse was spotted on the Mongolia steppes in 1969. Today, we can find a few herds in China and Mongolia thanks to the reintroduction of horses born in partial captivity. But despite all the conservation efforts being made, the total world population of Przewalski's horses is still fewer than 1,500. This foal, born in early April, is only a week old. After having suckled a lot of milk, the little colt needs to rest, and a little nap always feels good. And since his mother never strays far from his side, and he's feeling very sleepy, the best thing would be to take a proper siesta. Nobody likes to be bothered when they're catching 40 winks. During the month of May, the shoots of the Pyrenean oaks begin to grow quickly, and the velvety leaves start to clothe the naked branches of the old trees. Spring begins to display itself in all its splendor, and a tapestry of colors covers the whole Mediterranean forest. The birth of the young of many animal species coincides with this period of abundance. And the bison that live in the ancient forest of centenarian oak trees have also brought a new member into the herd. After a gestation period lasting 264 days and weighing a healthy 25 kilos, this little female is good news for the conservation of the European bison. The bison herd is lolling around after having spent the whole morning grazing, and this moment of peace and tranquility is when they regurgitate the half-digested grass in their stomachs to chew it once more, adding more saliva and swallowing it again. The plant matter paste they make this way ferments in specialized stomach chambers in a symbiotic process with bacteria. This process is called rumination, 
and bison are ruminants. When their stomachs are full, they feel like taking a good nap. The calm bison need to relax to digest properly. This young bison doesn't like the new member of the herd very much. And once she's been pushed out of her spot, the little one takes advantage of the chance to suckle a little. Only a week old, she doesn't graze on grass yet and only gets her energy from her mother's milk. In spring, the changes in the weather are dramatic. Clouds form quickly thanks to the large amount of moisture released when the sun heats the surface of the land. And in a few minutes, the rain falls to the ground again, bringing the water back to the ancient forest of centenarian oaks and their new inhabitants. The rain didn't last long, but it rained hard enough to get the little calf wet. And there's only one way to dry off quickly. During the hot summer, the color of the landscape gradually changes. The green that covered the ground in springtime turns to a yellow the color of straw due to the dry soil. Bison live in herds usually formed by 10 to 15 animals between adult females and their calves, adult males, and young bison from two to three years old. Nonetheless, these herds are not family groups. The different herds exchange members, and sometimes the herd divides into two or merges with other nearby groups. Bison aren't territorial, and different herds may occupy the same territory without leading to conflicts between them. They share clearings in the forest and the meadows, as well as watering places. Przewalski's horses are also social animals that live in herds led by a dominant male, while the rest of the herd is made up of females with young less than two years old. When they turn two, they leave the group. The males try to form their own herd or try to take over another male's herd, while the females join other different groups, thus guaranteeing that genes are interchanged. This herd is in luck. After an 11th month gestation period, one of the females is about to give birth. The group accompanies her to the edge of the forest. 
From here, she will continue on alone to look for a quiet hidden place where she can foal. The bison have also decided to rest in the old oak forest. When the sun shines the hottest, they seek the shade of the thick crowns of the big oaks. What's more, a little clearing in the oak forest offers the perfect place for one of those dust baths they love so much. Rolling in mud or dirt has several benefits. That's how they manage to clean the oils from their coats. And the dust also convinces many parasites to leave their host. Unfortunately, there's no good news from the herd of horses. The female is having trouble foaling. The foal was positioned badly in the womb, and its body has gotten stuck inside the mother. The little foal is dead, and if its mother can't manage to expel its body, she'll die too. Given that the population of Przewalski's horses is so low, the death of a foal is terrible, but the loss of a breeding adult mare would be even worse. Another mare watches her, but isn't able to do anything to help. Something draws the attention of this young roe deer resting in the shade. She watches carefully as two horses come out of the dense forest. The pregnant mare has managed to expel the dead foal's body. Fortunately, the mother has survived this difficult birth. As the afternoon advances, the heat gradually subsides and the bison herd gets on the move again in search of food. They don't know it, but someone is watching them. Safe up on its high perch, a goshawk observes with curiosity the most intimate behavior of these large mammals. The northern goshawk is widely distributed throughout the northern hemisphere, from North America to the large central regions of Asia. The bison herd has invaded its hunting grounds, and with their comings and goings, they've scared off any potential prey. So the goshawk decides to look for someplace quieter. This mid-sized bird of prey is perfectly adapted to living in the heart of the forest. Its skill in dodging obstacles makes it a formidable predator. Its habitual prey are mid-sized birds, such as the members of the crow family and pigeons, and small mammals, with a special preference for squirrels, hares, and rabbits. The goshawk is a great strategist. It likes to hide in the thick foliage of the oak trees on the edges of clearings in the forest and wait to surprise some careless animal. 
like this little rabbit. The rabbit, sensing the danger is near, ducks in an attempt to go unseen. But it's too late. This old fallen tree trunk shelters another of the inhabitants of the forest of centenarian oaks. A tawny owl found safe haven in its hollow interior, and as the last rays of sunlight die away, this little nocturnal bird of prey gets ready to go out to dinner. Tawny owls aren't very picky when it comes time to eat, and their diet includes everything from large invertebrates to birds, reptiles, and amphibians. A juvenile robin attracts its attention, but the owl seems to fancy something else for dinner tonight. The favorite meal of this chubby, robust bird of prey is dormice, mice, and voles, and these small rodents tend to leave their hiding places in search of food when the sun goes down. A little spring near the old fallen tree trunk is the perfect place to take the last bath of the day. Birds need to bathe frequently, not only to cool off on hot summer days, but also to maintain their feathers in perfect condition. That's essential, as their survival may depend on it. The noise the little forest birds make as they bathe distracts the tawny owl again and again as it tries to concentrate on locating a delicious little field mouse. It decides it would be better to look for a perch a little farther away where it can wait for dinner to arrive in peace.
This little mouse, which has just emerged from its burrow, doesn't know that it's been invited to dinner with the tawny owl, much less that the owl is the diner and the mouse the first course. Large, unmistakable birds that are perfectly adapted to detecting and eating carrion fly in circles over the ancient forest of centuries-old oak trees. Vultures are arriving by the dozens, a sign that death has paid a visit to this small corner of the Mediterranean forest. The bison impassively observe as the griffin vultures and a smaller number of cenarius vultures jostle with each other as they fight for a bite of flesh. These efficient carrion eaters fulfill an important hygienic role. They're in charge of making dead bodies disappear and so preventing diseases from spreading. <laughs> This time, the carcass must not have been very big because the banquet has ended quite quickly and many of the vultures didn't even get a taste. The remains that the vultures had found belonged to the foal that died during birth and its scant 25 kilos weren't enough to feed this horde of scavengers. Some of the vultures take advantage of this short break on the ground to clean and comb their feathers. Others, however, like the contentious Cenarius vultures, can't stop squabbling. slowly but surely, and the green oak leaves begin to change color. Autumn is here. All the inhabitants of this small corner of the Mediterranean forest know that they have to get ready for the arrival of the winter cold. Besides storing energy inside their bodies in the form of fat, their hair grows on the outside, creating a thick insulating coat that protects them from the cold and rain. The magical forest of centenarian oaks takes on a golden tone. Where the European bison and Brezhvalsky's horses seem like mythological beings out of a fairy tale. A 
Although European bison also like meadows and open spaces where it's easier to find food, today's small population has been limited to forests of deciduous trees and mixed forests of leafy and coniferous trees. They wander through the forests in small herds, feeding on grasses, tree bark, and branches. An adult male can eat up to 32 kilos of food in one day, of which 30% is woody material. In areas where the vegetation is particularly thick, they're able to clear out the foliage substantially and can even create clearings in the forests. Bison love to eat the tips of branches. Their curved horns allow them to snag and break off branches or small trees in order to eat the leaves. This young cow watches closely as the big bull easily breaks off the crown of a small oak tree. With their great strength and enormous appetite, bison can clear out the underbrush and maintain the health of forests that aren't used today to raise livestock. This technique requires a bit of practice in addition to having a big strong body, so the more adult members there are in the herd, the more efficiently it can clean up the forest. The young female will have to wait a bit longer before she'll be able to break off branches and small tree trunks easily. The biggest bull in the herd has been watching the young cow as she tried unsuccessfully to break a branch, and he decides to teach her firsthand how it's done. As he tosses his big head, his pupil watches the master's lesson intently. The forest of centenarian oaks provides all the food that the herd needs. Little by little, the bison sense that the mild warm days of autumn are coming to an end.
The first white blanket of snow to cover the ground announces that the winter cold has appeared on the scene. The European bison is the largest mammal that lives on the old continent. The big bulls can stand up to two meters high and weigh more than a thousand kilos. With that impressive physique, they've got few natural enemies. Wolves are their only possible predators, and these only dare to attack weak or sick individuals. These big animals are perfectly accustomed to winter's low temperatures. So the light snowfalls of winter in southern Europe present no problems for them. With their large and powerful heads, they sweep away the layer of snow covering the ground as they look for food. And often the snow gets stuck in their long beards. Until only a few hundred years ago, European bison were found widely in a large part of Europe, where men hunted them indiscriminately. The last bison remaining in the wild were confined to the Białowieża region in Poland, where they were exterminated during the First World War when they were slaughtered by the hundreds to feed the refugees and the soldiers at the front. The species would have gone completely extinct if it weren't for the 50 European bison then living in zoos scattered all over the world. Many of these bison had been born in captivity and genetically were practically identical, while others were already too old to mate. So in reality, only a dozen genetically distinct bison remained. The approximately 5,000 European bison living today descend from those 12 parents. Their low genetic diversity, a consequence of their common ancestry, has made these animals especially vulnerable to viruses like foot and mouth disease. That's why it's important to keep many small herds in places that are distant from each other. The herd of horses prefers to look for food under the majestic centuries-old oaks. Here, the layer of snow is thinner, and finding food is much easier. Grass, leaves, and an acorn here and there help to quiet a grumbling stomach. One of the mares in the herd wanders away from the group while a red kite looks on. Something has drawn the attention of this young female. A wild boar's carcass lies on the white blanket covering the floor of the old oak forest, and the red kite is a scavenger. Red kites are very mistrustful, and until the mare walks far away enough, it won't dare to fly down to the unfortunate boar's carcass.
In the past, the red kite was a fairly common bird in much of Europe. But during the 20th century, its population dropped significantly because people persecuted them intensely, a persecution that was the result of ignorance, since this beautiful bird has quite a limited impact as a predator. When hunting, it favors prey it can capture easily, such as small, sick, or inexperienced animals. And its marked tendency to eat carrion means that it makes the most of the remains of animals that are already dead. has a hard time accepting the presence of the enormous bison and feels safer in the heights. Not far from there, a young and inexperienced Cenarius vulture is watching the scene too. The red kite returns to the feast when the danger has moved away and has to grab the chance to fill its belly as quickly as it can. The young Cenarius vultures present in the oak forest may attract more vultures looking for their next meal. The inexpert vulture has concluded quite correctly that the red kite is no match for him and has decided that he wants to sit down at the table for this succulent feast. With a wingspan of almost three meters, the Cenarius vulture is the largest bird of prey soaring in Europe's skies. During the 20th century, it went extinct in most of the continent and today, its most important populations are limited to the Iberian Peninsula. Although they can often be seen together with mobs of griffin vultures, Cenarius vultures aren't fond of big crowds. These big birds of prey can often be seen flying low over the forests, painstakingly scanning the landscape. Thanks to this strategy, they can spot small carcasses, even in areas with thick vegetation, which may go unnoticed by other carrion-eating species. Until only a few decades ago, the snowfalls in regions with a continental Mediterranean climate were heavier, and if the days were cold, they could last for weeks. Nowadays, the layer of snow doesn't tend to last long. The weather can change quickly, with snow, sunshine, wind and rain 
all happening on the same day. The most powerful eagle has also located the wild boar's carcass. The golden eagle is an expert hunter. Although it specializes in hunting rabbits and hares, its diet can include partridges and pigeons, and even large reptiles. Nevertheless, the chance to eat carrion without having to spend any of its energy reserves is a good alternative. With a wingspan of more than two meters, this majestic bird of prey has adapted to living in mountainous areas where it builds its nests on rocky cliffs. And the old forest of centenarian oak trees lies within its home range. Thousands of years ago, our ancestors followed the big herds of herbivores as they migrated in search of new pasture lands. They were completely exterminated on the plains and in the forests of the Mediterranean basin and restricted to Central Europe and Asia. Representations of bison, horses, and aurochs appear many times on the walls of caves where ancient human populations sought shelter. No doubt they hunted them not for pleasure, but out of necessity. All of us are ethically obliged to preserve these species and keep the bison and wild horses from going completely extinct. Both have been fundamental to the survival and evolution of the human species. Meanwhile, these few survivors, a reflection of what they were in other times, coexist each day with the animal species that prowl around in this magical forest. They are the inhabitants of the forest of centenarian oak trees.